All right, so we're gonna go um, ahead quickly into our first Q&A session. So I hope persons have questions, because this is the time to ask all the questions that you desire. We have our panel right here. I'm gonna carry out the second mic so you can speak into the microphone, and please feel free to be open and answer all the questions that you need.
you should not be too rich and then you start to get ready to go to the hospital. And depending on where you live, if you live in um, Mona, you don't have to leave out in an hour. But if you live in Balban, St. Elizabeth, then you need to start within at two hours because it's going to take you that much longer to get to care. It's important though, if you're having such an private every night, this is also a risk factor for having impotence. If you're not having a major episode, so if you have that, you should come to clinic. There are medications that we can put you on that can prevent the night episodes. There are other things apart from exercise, drinking lots of water, urinating, taking a warm bath that can also help it to go away. But if you're having recurrent stuttering episodes, it can lead to impotence and you should come into the clinic. We have a urology clinic. Dr. Belinda Morris is the head of urology at UA. She comes. So if you're having that problem, come in and we will we will advise you. My is usually here so far. For Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey, I had an experience recently, last week, Tuesday to be in fact. I got a refer to a clinic, to the clinic on Reddit Road. I got a little bit late. I went after 9 o'clock. The reason for that, I had diarrhea in the morning. So I was wondering to see if it was okay or I could wait a bit. When I went, um, I was told that the time had passed for registration. So I thought, okay, should I leave? However, I was told by the security not to leave because I have another assessment at 11. I waited. I saw the doctor who was responsible for doing the assessment. He left at 11, or he left at 11. And he came back about after 12. At I think after 2 o'clock, the, the customer care rep said to him, this lady and that gentleman is waiting to see you. He said, come. I went to... I went to... Huh? Come to you? I went into a room with him. And when I went into that room, he... I gave him the referral and everything. He looked at me and he smiled. And then he said, I can't see you. So I said, what? You know, I started living after I was having come into m and age and I had been trained how I need to. Yes, sir. Of course. So I said, why not? He said, because you were referred and he stopped seeing patients from Whatever time it does, but I've been here since afternoon, so why can't I be seen? Anyway, I'm just trying to understand what's going on and also trying to measure my response because I've been getting upset and I figured if I got angry, he would not see me at all. So I have done my head a little. My time I pulled up my head. The other patient, this daughter, were in the room. I thought, but my privacy is being disrespected right here. Hey, when I see her, the man said, she's just collecting her things to be. Finish with me. Done. Not more. And I'm on that great day. How do I respond? I mean, I, I didn't even get an opportunity to react to the fact that I'm not going to be seen after waiting from after 9 o'clock and not after 2. And you're telling me to, because I was referred. Did it make sense? How can I be referred and I won't be seen simply for that? And then he just started speaking to the other man. To know I want to make a complaint, but I need to understand. Because, because I'm not familiar with the system of the care. He said that. I am not to be seen once 8 o'clock is passed. No, there is no such rule. There is no such rule. I know, I understand, and if you run a facility, you can understand. You don't want patients coming in at 1 o'clock or whatever. But you were there at 9, 
and that is not acceptable for you not to be seen at 9 o'clock and you need to lodge a complaint. You need to document the day when it happened. Maybe you, did you find out the name of the doctor? No, I didn't. Um, you should have. I was you introduced. He, he got my name, um, but he never... What well, if you have the dates? They will know who was on call at that time. Okay. All right, you need to document this. You need to write a letter. But first of all, next time when you're there, all right, you need to ask for who is the doctor in charge of this facility. Actually, I did afterwards okay. um, because I couldn't figure, I couldn't understand why is it that I can't be seen because I have to refer to Right. Um, but nobody, nobody could tell me who was in charge. I went to the to the customer service young man. I said, who is in charge? Who is your boss here? He doesn't have a boss here. I said, wait, you mean nobody is in charge of this facility? Nobody is in charge. They said, but who you get your work? So he said, you went to Zero. And but he had a dismissive behavior too. He said that when oh, you were assessed, I said, what? And then I think that kind of a started. You were assessed? What do they mean by that? You have to get an assessment. Um, screen? No, he, he never said screen. He said assessment. So I, I, I am assuming that they just check it all the time and call just to see if it really. All right, well, despite all of that, what you need to do, you need to write to the medical officer of health that is responsible for that facility, the Kingston and St. Andrew Health Department. All right, you can call them. All right, I can give you the number. You call them. Make a documentation. They you don't know the name of the doctor, but they will know who was on duty on that day. And you don't you, you, you shouldn't let this pass. You shouldn't let this pass at all. You need, because if we if we keep letting them get away with this, it will continue. Because you are not being unreasonable. You did not arrive after twelve, all right, which most people um, would have ignored you after twelve, which we can understand, which is not right, even that is not right. But you were there at that time. So you need to document it and I'll, I'll give you the number and who to write to. Okay? And did you look that it was this place, patient charter was this plane on the wall of the of the health center? The Sunrise Health Center you went to, you said ready to Okay. Thank you for a very informative uh, presentation as to all of you. Uh, my question is uh, how common is uh, sickle cell thalassemia in Jamaica? And what are the major types that we have? We have um, both the Indian um, genes and the African genes for thalassemia um, in Jamaica. And so we have S beta plus and S beta naught and quite a variety in terms of severity of S beta plus. It is much less common than SS or SC, um, maybe one in nine, one in, certainly less than, maybe one in a thousand or less. I don't carry that particular statistic in my head, but S beta thalassemia is less common than SS or SC. And it is split into S beta plus and S beta naught. In S beta naught, that gene does not produce any A at all, so it's equivalent to SS. Whereas in S beta plus, there is some amount of hemoglobin A produced, but it is less. And that can vary from a mild type to a more severe type. Did you have a particular reason for being interested in S beta tha? Not really, because we are a mixed population, so. Yes, and as I said, even the S, some of the people in Jamaica who have S is an Asian haplotype. Okay, because we are mixed. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Alright, so for one, I'm a bit concerned. Alright, as always, we're well, probably 10% of but um, in the presentation, I see we're, we're like 15% of the population. 15% is what? Of sickle cell. Three. 
Three. Three. Okay. In Japanese, Three. that's where. Sickle cell disease is one in one fifty, of okay. which two thirds have SS disease. All right. So uh, it's less than one percent. One. Oh, less than one percent. Less than one percent. Okay. All right. I was because I was a bit concerned about um, that in terms of the financing of the sickle cell unit and in terms of government's contribution. As a bit, as warning about that. Okay, so we are a, a, a very strange entity because we are a unit as a part of a uh, university. We do not fall under the Ministry of Health, we fall under the Ministry of Education. Um, the Ministry of Health has a very um, strong interest in sickle cell disease and is trying to, to improve and strengthen the program. Um, we recently met with the Minister of Health, the Honorable Minister of Health, and we made the case that uh, we should have additional support. So we are in the process of writing that up as a project to submit for further support. So they do give us a very small subvention annually. It does, I mean, we, I looked at it. In terms of just newborn screening alone, our staff costs are about $10 million a year just for newborn screening, because that's two med techs, a data entry clerk, and a, a nursing uh, coordinator, plus a driver, because we have to go out and trace people. Um, so the university actually pays all of the salaries, so that's quite a substantial um, investment right there. And then um, we're a part of research institute, which gets one budget. That budget was decreased by a bit by the university. And so we were in a position where we felt that we wanted to be able to guarantee a certain minimum standard, and that is why we instituted the, the fee. Because that fee doesn't go back into the consolidated fund. That fee is entirely with us. Dr. King um, manages that fee. So we are able to make sure that we can purchase the things that are required in terms of the medications if you're in the treatment room, the gloves for the nurses and the medics they use, the needles and so on. So that those funds go directly to that. But we are in the process of trying to um, get increased um, support from the ministry. Um, as well as we're out looking for private um, funders who may be willing to help us continue. So that's an ongoing process. Um, the other thing is that our philosophy is very much that we're one thing in one place. What we all seek is equity of healthcare. So it's not reasonable for people to have to travel very far for a reasonable standard of care for sickle cell disease. So we have a very um, strong emphasis, together with the Ministry of Health, on on training. So the idea is to train doctors, particularly in the public health service, but also private doctors who avail themselves to the training. Um, so that wherever you go, they are aware, they use the sickle cell unit clinical care guidelines which you publish, and which the ministry accepted as our local standard of care. And so if you go to Portland or Westmoreland or wherever, they should know how to treat routine things in sickle cell disease, and then we are available for consultation. We get consults from across the Caribbean. Okay. Um, one of the problems that I usually have is if I have to go over to UAE, and um, as much as I say I'm in a crisis, I don't go over to UAE and say, I absolutely have to. You mean the hospital? The hospital. So I go over there, you know, um, with a crisis, and I'm there for two hours. Well, you know, on three so, occasions. So sir, I want to say, don't take it personally. Yeah. Yes, there is stigma associated with with sickle cell disease. Yes, there are healthcare workers who uh, ascribe inappropriate health-seeking behaviors to um, our patients. But I was in a, a motor vehicle accident some years ago, and. I was in so much pain that I was crying while doing my statement to the police and he refused to take my statement. He said, Miss, you need to go to the hospital. You have a right. The policeman offered to take me to the hospital. I was in so much pain. I went to the hospital in pain 
And I'm so glad I said, um, can I speak to the, the, the consultant? And the person can. And I said, I know you don't know me. She said, no, man, you taught me. I said, okay. Can I please go to the sickle cell unit and get some pain relief and then come back for the rest of the process? No, 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 no. This won't get through. <laughs> 45 minutes later, okay? So I was there in that level of pain too. So I understand what you're saying, but don't take it personally that it's only sickle cell disease. No, it's not that. Because in one of the presentations that we did on, on um, practice, mm -hmm. I would be a spectacle if I'm up there. I've had um, an episode or two where it's a lot longer than, than what was in the presentation. But I know that I'm going to do a scope here to be a spectacle because I'm going to be, just think about a man coming up there with his extended. And then put on top of it, because one of the things that you have to do is pace around, try and get the blood going someplace else. And then you're not being seen as well. So it's so even though we have a paper that hey, this is what you should do, our current system does not assist us with that. Well, I think you've heard that when you don't get appropriate care, there is a, a, a process that we have to go through. Dr. Morrison, who is the head of urology up there, has had an interest in sickle cell disease and practice for several years. So I think that the training of the doctors up there should have been over the years. But I think if you're going to say I'm having pain, they might think you have bone pain, which is a common kind of sickle cell pain. If you are being triaged or assessed and you see this listen, I'm having priorism, I'm having pain in my penis, and they're paying you no attention, you have to say, I need to speak to the supervisor. This is urgent. This is life changing. Because impotence is not easy to live with. Hello, I'm Olivia Morgan. I was wondering, does the hydroxyurea help with the AVM? It's not going to reverse. It doesn't reverse. Well, I've seen a small study that they had, it was an, an Indian study, that in the early stages it actually aided in the healing. But for late stages of AVN, no, it doesn't reverse it, but it prevents progression. was discovered that um, I might have a slight alien going on. I'm supposed to get, um, Dr. Vaughn is supposed to get back to me with that, but um, he hasn't as yet, so I was just kind of wondering if it would help in any way, because I was kind of reading up on it. It's not an absolute indication, but it could be, uh, right? It's one of those raison ones where it's a case by case, so you need to come in and speak with one of the other doctors in the clinic. But can I tell you that when you have the pain in the hip, or sometimes pain in the knee, that is when you need to make sure that you're seen, because when you complain of pain in the knee, the doctor will always examine the hip. Because if when you're actually having an episode of pain in the hip, you actually don't wait there, you go on crutches for two weeks, then the, 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 the bone is not damaged. So that is what is really required for people to be aware that if they have a painful crisis in their acute pain in their hip or knee, they need to get checked out to make sure it's not hip. And if it's hip, I can't tell you, we try to tell people to go on crutches, they don't want to go on crutches. But the funny thing is, after the fall, then I realized that then you have No, no, but because, because you would have had that pain long ago, and you would have man uh, if that's the closest to the head of the female there. So if we were to examine everybody in the clinic, a lot of people would have some evidence of okay. some. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Yes, good afternoon everyone. Now my name is Joyce Stewart and when my daughter died about five years ago, uh, she was left for for your information. I am here to i I'm, I'm glad of the training that is being done at the AND. I'm just wondering if, um, I remember when my daughter used to go to the a and &E, and at night, right through the night, she had to be in a wheelchair. After she's in so much pain, she along with others, right through the night, in a wheelchair. So I'm wondering if all of that, you know, is still happening. Also, I would like to say, yes, then. Uh, no, no, it's a person, it's everybody. Okay. My niece who has a pulse, and sometimes been in the 
Jenny in a chair for two days with her lupus, with her ulcers, with her pain. It, it's everybody. This is the overwhelming. I mean, it's taking two days to be admitted to the hospital now after you have been accepted for admission to get a bed. Okay. So what, what, what can be done? Right now I'm here because more the person so the optimist for the Spanish town. Our project this year is to work with the Citizen Foundation. I have a colleague who works abroad and they are employed, interested in assisting, going on the website, asking for contributions and donations, and we will go through the optimist for the Spanish town to assist. If that's okay. Well, that's wonderful. So the people from the foundation are here. We are not yes, sure. Yes, I'll be in contact with them. So you can be and in contact so with them. That's, well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. The only thing I would say is, and I'm sure you're well aware because you're with uh, the optimist, is that if people are sending in any donation, the paperwork has to be done ahead of time yes. because we get a lot of problems where people donate and they don't realize that there's a process to go through and then when they get the bill at the end, the stuff doesn't end up coming. Okay. Just very quickly before we move on to the next person, that point is very important. People think that's because I have this disease or I am treated a certain way when I go to casual when I go to the ENE, it's everybody. And I started out by saying the philosophy, the, the policy for free health care is part of the problem because we need more resources. What proportion of the health of the total national GDP goes to hell. It is under what is recommended by the World Health Organization and it's an issue of resources and what your, your experience is normal. Most people, it takes two days to get an award. You sit in a wheelchair, you are left on a stretcher for days. I have a saying, which is this. You cannot get a champagne healthcare system on a Pepsi budget. Right? So when we stop shooting up each other and cutting up each other and having accidents on the, on, the, on the roads because our healthcare budget is small but too much of it is used for violence and trauma. And if we stop robbing each other and whatnot so they don't have to spend so much on security, they would have more for health. And if all of us paid our taxes, <laughs> then perhaps there will be more money the size of the pie we get to the pickup. So we have to look at ourselves too. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Taylor. I am a patient and I'm also a registered nurse. So I've been on both ends of the spectrum. And I must say, the gentleman spoke about the waiting time at the public hospitals, and I know from personal experience that it's ridiculous. And um, I work at Children's Hospital, and to be honest, in my experience, children who have sickle cell that come in with uh, an acute chest or a basal acoustic crisis, they're treated as a matter of emergency. So we don't allow them to have this extended waiting time out of their but um, sometimes, depending on what is happening, it, it, it cannot be helped. But I find that in the adult hospitals, especially at UA, it's not the same. And um, I realize where there's a perceived drug seeking behavior for sickle cell patients that, that you know, it, it really messed the whole thing up. It, they probably could have gotten through a little faster because, well, because of perception. Um, I realize in the public health, there's an extension now of a lot of our clinics all over. And I'm wondering, somewhere in the future, that can be a physical cell clinic. An extension to maybe 8 o'clock or, or so. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're not a part of the Ministry of Health. Yes. And we're not funded by the Ministry of Health. And actually, as I said, we're a part of the University of West Indies. So what you, you may not be aware is that all of us have requirements to keep our jobs and for promotion, which includes not just seeing patients, but also research and publication. Right. So when we finish in clinic, we go upstairs, even the, the medical officers go upstairs and do um, meetings and seminars and so on, and they have to work on um, the academic side of things as well. So we're not just all about service. I was talking about the sickle cell being a three-legged stool, clinical care, research, and education and training. 
So at this point in time, there is no likelihood in the foreseeable future. Maybe in Beijing, the government to see if they can have a session on a person's covering after the But what we're trying to do is to train people outside so that when you go somewhere else, you get better care than you're getting at all. In the current healthcare system, I don't foresee that happening right now. But I mean, personally, and this is just personally, I think that persons who can pay should be allowed to pay. That's my personal view. But, um, all right, so um, I move on from there. Um, in terms of parental education, I find that when parents are educated, siblings do better. And so we can focus some more on parental education. At home, treatment, they tend to have a better home. Again, those who actually keep their appointments get the education of people. Those who don't actually turn up when they're sick. They don't have to. I mean, when the person comes in with a uh, painful crisis, it's not the time that they're going to then do a lot of education or come from the treatment of the painful crisis. They're not going to then sit down and say, okay, this is what happened. No, man, this is what happened. That is a well visit. So, again, some of the responsibilities with patients to actually keep their well. Health maintenance visits because that is when education happens. One last point. Um, if I think the NHF does not provide hydroxyurea correctly, it does. It was yeah. a primary reason that they said. They do? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. for children, so children, most of them are spending less than five thousand dollars for. Most of the children are spending less than five thousand dollars for a month supply of hydroxyurea. So people are spending. $2,000. For adults, um, it's not double subsidy, but depending on your weight and how many tablets that you have to take, it you range from as low as 3000 and I've seen persons pay as much as 12000 but that is the minority. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Final question. <laughs>
get the hydroxyurea, how do I go about it? Do, do I just take her to the clinic and request it? And, okay, thank you. Oh, yes, that's All right, that was a very, very interactive Q&A session, and I'm very happy for that, and I'm glad that persons are learning new things about sickle cell. So, we are running a bit behind time. It's now five minutes past two o'clock. And first, I want to say that for persons who are interested in going to the restroom, if you exit the, through the glass doors here, and you go straight towards the elevator, it's to the left of the elevator. But we also have some refreshments outside by the door, so you're free to partake in that. We're going to try and have the break session about 15 minutes, because we are behind time, because it's so much information to share. And I also invite you, we have water from our lifespan partners, and we also have vision screening by Robin. So during the 15 minute break, if you'd like to pass by, I know it's just one person at a time, but please be back by 20 past two.